Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky. I am a web manager for the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all today to this month's Ask, Ask Nurse Linda. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Linda if you haven't attended one of our um, web chats. Um, she is a leader, teacher, provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years, and she has worked closely with Christopher Reeve on his recovery and has been advocating for the Reeve Foundation ever since. She also is a moderator for our Ask a Nurse discussion, which is on our online paralysis community. And she focuses on contributing functional advice, providing the how-to on integrating various healthcare improvements into daily life, and answering your specific questions. And as you are all here today, we have taken that once a month um, online to our online discussion. So I want to welcome you all here, and I now hand it over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello, and hello, everyone. Thank you again for tuning in to the Nurse Linda webinar. Um, the topic for today, um, which has been on the blogs uh, the last few weeks, is all about activity. And um, so I just wanted to talk. We have some questions and people have already written in. And so I just wanted to talk a few minutes about activity um, before we get into the questions and then while we, while we answer some of these questions, which uh, are some fascinating questions, um, maybe it'll give you some time to think about activity and some uh, issues with that. So activity is very important to all of us in our human body and to keeping it functional and keeping it healthy. And activity and mobility is very difficult sometimes for people who use uh, assistive mobility devices or just have some generalized mobility problems or maybe have not much mobility in their uh, functional abilities. But activity can still be obtained either what we call actively by, by um, engaging our bodies and moving them around. But there's also a big part of healthcare that we call uh, passive motion, and that is when we physically move our body parts to get that activity challenging going to our body. So you don't have to have mobility to have activity, but you do need to have some activity in your life to keep your body healthy. There's so many things that activity helps us with, with our, you know, our breathing, which helps our respiratory system, as well as keeping our um, bones strong and our, our joints active and our muscles stretched out so it can help with spasticity reduction. And one of the things that we know about activity is the more activity we have in our legs, the better our bowel function works. So if we're having problems with our, our bowel programs, um, it, having some activity either active or passively in our legs has been demonstrated to help with improving bowel function. A sidelight to that and a little experiment that I was involved in uh, with some individuals years ago was, was looking at activity and what I noticed is that people's um, bladder health stayed much improved with activity. And the reason for that is as you move your legs, even if it's passively, that's kind of shaking up your abdomen and so it keeps um, the urine in your bladder it will help move it around so it keeps it in motion rather than just sitting still stagnant in your, in your bladder. So if you think about you're having that iced tea, it's the end of the summer and we're having some lovely summer days and you think, oh, a nice delicious iced tea would be so good. And it, you know, it's not quite as cold as you would like it, so you swirl it around in your glass a little bit. And that gets the fluid in the glass moving around the ice, and so it gets the iced tea colder. Well, the same thing happens in your bladder. As you're moving around, it swirls the fluid, the urine in your bladder, and so it keeps bacteria from multiplying so quickly inside the bladder. So there's lots of advantages to moving. I um, put a challenge out to the readers of the blog about how to incorporate activity into your daily life and thank you so much. We had so many wonderful responses, some ideas that were really innovative. Um, we also had some ideas about some people are really kind of locked into the idea that they can only have activity in their life if they're going to a rehabilitation center or they have the therapist doing that activity for them. And there are a lot of things that you can do that you can participate on your own in your own home, either um, move, ranging your legs, moving about, um, 
moving about in your wheelchair, stretching your extremities. Um, every time you transfer, you're actually participating in some sort of activity. So there's a lot of things that you can do in, in your home without having a lot of expensive equipment. Um, the challenge for everyone, if you have paralysis or if you don't have paralysis, is actually taking time to do it. You know, there's the old joke about um, people doing their New Year's resolution and they go to the gym so you never, in January, so you never want to go to the gym in January because it's very, very crowded, but by February everybody's, oh, I've had enough of this exercise. So they lose their New Year's resolution by February. So it's, it's, it's a process to incorporate into your daily life, but I think the key is actually doing that incorporation into your daily life as opposed to um, you know, just waiting for a certain time and making it a task, but incorporating it into your daily life. So doing some kind of push-up or stretching your legs you know, maybe while you watch a certain TV program. I know a lot of people use the Wheel of Fortune. There's a lot of Wheel of Fortune fans out there. And that's when people will do their exercise. It's a timed half an hour. You know when it's coming. You know when it's finished. And while you're enjoying your favorite show, you can easily be doing some stretching. Um, now, activity does not necessarily have to be, um, you know, overstimulating or um, you don't have to uh, subscribe to an Olympic athlete's type of activity. Just about any kind of movement will help you. So um, there are things that are pretty easy to get a, uh, your hands on, uh, regardless of the type of insurance system you have, one being a standing frame. And those are pretty standard of care now. So just about all the states, not all of them, but just about all the states will allow a standing frame uh, for if you have a spinal cord injury. Something to think about. When you switch your activity and you get a little more mobile, you do also need to think about your clothing and the opportunities for skin breakdown or um, things that might happen to you because now you're moving instead of being still. So looking at the waistband of your pants when you're being active, does it rub? Do your clothes fit the same way when you're in the standing frame versus uh, when you're sitting in your chair? And then also we had a, a big section on shoes and looking at, you know, when you, when you have shoes and you put them on and you're sitting, they fit one way, but when you stand in them, they fit another way. So being careful to pick out shoes that are safe and functional for people to uh, uh, select and use because when you change your position, you're going to be changing the way your feet fit in your shoes. We had a very insightful comment about the shoe fitting, and it was really a very interesting comment. I enjoyed it very much. Um, it came in just this morning about it was really about um, neurogeneration and wearing shoes. So we know that okay. in infants and okay. children when they're learning to walk that um, you know we used to put kids in these really stiff white shoes and it was very difficult for them to walk around and we know it's much easier to have um, a moccasin type shoe and you can, you can see in the children's department now they have much more soft-soled shoes for learning to walk. So you get all those messages through the bottom of your feet and you get those sensations when you're learning to walk. Uh, it's an important concept for people who are doing exercise and recovering from spinal cord injury to get that also that same sensation. However, those um, moccasin-type shoes won't pr protect your feet very well if you bump up against something. But it was a very insightful comment so if you get a chance, you might want to look at that. It was really quite interesting. Um, so if you want to get into some of the uh, more advanced therapies and your insurance does not cover it, you can always um, talk with your healthcare provider or your case manager about what they call a letter of medical necessity, which is becoming more, it, it, it has always been around, but I'm seeing much more literature about it in uh, the common uh, websites and um, places where I go on the internet. There's a lot more articles about letters of medical necessity. And these are letters that are written to your payer that ask for equipment or treatment 
that is not normally covered by that particular payer. Your healthcare professional is the best person to write that because they can explain their, your condition using medical terminology and then they can go ahead and um, work with the insurance company maybe to get you some advanced therapy. Um, it really comes down to the payer if they want to do that or not. If they provide advanced therapy for one of their insurance members, they have to provide it for all their insurance members. So it's a bigger picture than just your individual case. But a lot of people are successful with this. And some of the equipment, um, if you go to some of the advanced therapies equipment companies, they will have sample letters of medical necessity for their particular equipment. So it's a, you know, your healthcare provider can write that letter for you and you know, it's a shot. Um, they may or may not approve it, but it's a good opportunity um, to see if you, can, if you can obtain some of those therapies or some of that equipment. So let's take a minute here and look at the questions. Um, last month we had a person from Australia that had written in about looking for FES for the upper arms. And so um, there's some uh, issues that they have. They're still looking for that FES cycle. Now this person already has an FES cycle and for the lower extremities. And so probably the the most economical form of action would be to contact the provider of that piece of equipment. There is probably an add-on for upper extremities, just about all of the um, FES cycling for lower extremities have an add-on. There's only a few companies that make these, but of the companies I know, they have add-ons for upper extremity. So you could adapt the lower extremity cycle to be used for, with the upper extremity, and that would be probably the most economical. But if you're looking for a completely different advice, uh, device, there are devices that um, have the upper extremity along with the lower extremity. Now, the upper extremity, sometimes they are passive, so that when you pedal the, the FES bike, when you're using the electrical stimulation on your legs, your arms can passively move. But this person's looking for the electrical stimulation to the upper arms, um, and so they want to have that stimulation going on the arms also. And those are available um, with most FES bicycles. Now the complication here is that um, they have some problems with their joints in their arm, which could um, impact the ability to do the upper limb cycling. And so it would really depend um, they have less than 90 degree motion. So you might be able to adapt the upper extremity cycling um, to that. I think it would be kind of a narrow band. It might be very difficult. Um, but the people who create these bikes would be able to provide that information to you. If, in fact, the upper extremity biking does not work out and you know that can't be adapted with this particular construction, constraint that this individual has. Uh, another thing you can look at is there are little um, FES simulators that can be used just on the upper extremity. So the evidence that we have is that um, the cycling, the repetitive pattern movement <coughs> is very important. However, um, if you can get muscle contractions just using uh, one of these little stimulators, you don't have to rely on the elbow motion. Now, does that do as well as the FES cycling? I don't know of any evidence that has ever looked at that because the pattern movement is so important. But at least just applying the electrical stimulation to the upper extremities would give you that contraction relaxation of the muscles in the upper arms, which would therefore stimulate uh, the nerves, but maybe not as quite as in an impactful way. So would it be helpful? Definitely. Would it be the same? That we wouldn't be sure about. But it would be interesting to see, to try, and um, to see how that compares. And that might be an opportunity maybe in working with one of the manufacturers for the upper extremity FES um, stimulators that are not attached to a bike and doing a little study with those companies to see, you know, sending the information um, with the consent of that individual 
to that company that they could compare it to the biking. And that might be something that they might really be interested and in welcoming in which then you could get that um, device for free or you could get it for trial in your particular facility. So, you know, there's always kind of workarounds. There's always some kind of way of doing things. And I see that we have a person here with their hand raised. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And uh, David, would you like to come on board? And um, do you have a question? Oh, the question's typed in. Is, is there, there's some states that provide better programs for SEI than others. Well, this is the thing. Um, I guess it all depends on your point of view. I don't know that there's some states that provide better coverage than others. Um, right now, in the economy of individual states, is an interesting phenomenon going on. So um, Medicaid is a federal program, but it's administered by states. So when you have Medicaid, um, the state is the is the the state that you are in is the person who has the the information of, and has control over how the money of the state is divvied out to the individuals on Medicaid. I don't know if one is um, better than other others, um, but some people, some states have different benefits that other states don't yet have, but they all seem to catch up over time. So it's not uniform at any one particular time, but it kind of varies. And it's, you know, one state might offer something that another state doesn't offer. But now this is the thing about the economy of the United States right now, and I just, I just got into this last week, in that some of our states are having quite a bit of financial difficulties. And so they are withdrawing some of the benefits. The benefits are still there. You still have, uh, uh, you can still apply for those particular benefits. They are there. But they don't have the money to fund the benefits. So you might be put on a waiting list for a standing frame in some particular states, but it might take you several years before the money is, is allotted to you. So you might get approval. They might offer standing frames for people with spinal cord injury, and you would apply, and they would say, okay, we'll give you a standing frame. But due to the economic um, issues in some of the states, you might not get that standing frame for a couple of years, which is, you know, in a couple of years it'll be helpful, but we really don't want to wait a couple of years. So we're going to have to see how all that um, ferrets out. So it's just kind of an interesting phenomenon that's going on right now, and I, I, I had just learned of this. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with that, and that we will just all have to stay tuned to see what's going on with that. So um, let's see. There's another one. Um, now somehow that other one opened for me, but now for some reason Anthony's hand is up, and I'm not able to read his question. So let's see. See. Linda, um, the question typed in, in the chat box you were reading uh -huh. it was earlier. Uh huh. So, so oh, here's Anthony, the question yeah. down here. You were viewing it with uh, Bernadette earlier. Uh -huh. um, oh, yes. This is um, uh, the person who is having the neurogenic uh, bladder problems with an indwelling suprapubic, and they're having trouble with repeated UTIs and dysreflexia. And so I guess my question to you um, is to see about what medications you're taking for the dysreflexia. There's some medications that you can take that will help uh, reduce the dysreflexia. It's probably, the dysreflexia is probably starting from, um, not, I'm just surmising because I don't know this particular patient, but most generally what happens is sometimes that indwelling uh, suprapubic catheter causes bladder spasms, 
which can um, lead to some pain, and of course that leads to autonomic dysreflexia, which is a problem. So there are some medications that you can take to kind of uh, calm the dysreflexia. There's also some medications uh, and some interventions which this person has done with bladder Botox and um, uh, doing some antibiotics. So they're doing everything that they possibly can within the bladder. And so the next, the next issue is maybe uh, trying a double balloon ca catheter, um, which, you know, that would be the simplest thing to try. They are worried about some of the complications um, that can come from a double balloon catheter. Um, the other thing that's being suggest suggested is um, more surgery, which they're really, you know, not anxious to have, um, the surgery being an ileostomy. Um, another thing that you might want to think about it is another surgery, but is a, a mitrofanoff procedure, which is a little less complicated and allows the bladder to remain intact. But instead of a catheter being present in your bladder at all times, you actually intermittently catheterize in a little um, hole that's usually made. It usually goes in through the uh, navel or the belly button. So that might be something you want to talk with your doctors about too. Other than that, you might want to try some medication to try to help control some of those, um, some of the autonomic dysreflexia because it seems like everything has been tried to kind of calm that, that bladder. So um, best of luck to you. Please let me know how that turns out. There's still other options being um, maybe less severe procedures or sometimes um, if you try a particular treatment like the Botox and it doesn't work the first time and it doesn't work the second time, but it might work the fourth or fifth time. So sometimes you have to you know, work with these things a little bit. Maybe you've left the Botox and you go on to some other medications and so then you go back to the Botox which didn't work the first time but now it does. So it's really trial and error with a lot of these things, why they work sometimes and they, and they don't work the first time, but they work the second time. So um, these are just all things that would be a really interesting um, kind of trial and error period for you. As frustrating as it is, these are just some of the things because everybody's a little different and of course everybody's spinal cord injury is a little different and we're never sure exactly what is working and what is not working. So even though we have our assessments, sometimes there's a little nerve that's getting through. You obviously have some uh, functional connection because you're having pain in the bladder. So something is working for you and that, you know, pain is not, we always think of that as, oh gosh, I want to get away from this pain, but that's a good thing in this case. So something is working there. So that's, that's at least the good news of that. Um, so we have uh, Bernadette who is talking about um, er, uh, doing some exercise and she's using TheraBands with handles. If you're not familiar with these, you can get TheraBand um, at your pharmacy. It's, it's um, I would say, you know, as far as exercise equipment goes, it's pretty inexpensive. It's kind of expensive for exactly what you are getting, but it's actually pretty inexpensive um, in the overall scheme of things. And this is like, um, a strip of uh, like stretchy, plasticky kind of material, so it has some gives that you have some resistance when you're working. And we know with activity, having some resistance gives us a little bit more power and a little bit more oomph to our exercise. Um, another thing to think about um, with the therabands that helps with working core, and Bernadette does that while she's sitting and works on her balance. And balance is really helped a lot by working our core. So if you can do exercises by stretching over the sides of your wheelchair, if you have um, a good uh, sitting balance and you're able to, and you want to be very careful about this, um, leaning forward and pulling your body up is another good thing. So m moving side to side, you have your armrests to kind of help hold you in place. But if you're able to 
bend forward or if you have somebody who's close by that can stand by you while you're leaning forward. And then the other thing is to um, don't forget about exercising going backwards so that you have to sit on the edge of the bed because if your chair back is going to keep you from leaning backwards. So think about going all directions when you're doing your stretching. Oftentimes people do that in bed before they get up because it kind of limbers us up. You know, we all like to have a good stretch before we get up in the morning because it loosens our bodies up. So think about when you're doing your stretching, you also need to lay on your side so that you can um, pull your legs towards the back um, so you can move your arms and shoulders back so you're not just moving to the front or to the side and up and down. You need to move to the back also. Um, Let's see. um, uh, let's see. I'm going to see if it, I'm just going to jump in. It's Julie. Um, is there anybody on the phone line that has a, a question related to our topic today? Um, exercise and activity? Okay. Just wanted to give people a chance if they were on the phone line to go ahead. Um, but we can go back to the chat box. Okay, so there's a question um, from someone who's in India, and they have a, the person has a contusion from C3 to C7 level, and a compression at C3, C4, and at C5, C6. So um, that's a lot of uh, levels of the spinal cord. So first of all, he must be having very good care because that's that's a lot of levels to have injured. But he has some power in his um, in his extremities, and so even though this is uh, very slight power, he still has some power. So he, uh, as the contusion resolves, so he should get if it's just truly a contusion, he should be able to get some return of function. So he wants to do, he should be doing exercise to strengthen his lower extremities and keeping his upper extremities strong at the same time. Um, He has a compression, so that that is probably the area where the spinal cord injury itself is going to be uh, the issue of concern. So will he be able to walk at some point in time? And of course, I you know, would not have the answer to that particular question. But if he can receive any kind of therapy, now in some countries, um, therapy is only provided to extremities that are already working. If the extremity doesn't have any function, then people oftentimes don't get therapy to that. But you can certainly look on the uh, Reeve website and get information about therapies that are available. Um, if you have a rehabilitation facility in India where he can take part in some therapies, that would be just grand. Um, but there are also some uh, treatments and exercises that would uh, you would be able to take advantage by looking at the website. Um, the Reeve Foundation has um, some uh, community people. I'm not sure if they have somebody in India, but I bet you these people will find somebody who will help you navigate through the rehabilitation process in India. So I would suggest that you um, contact the Reeve Foundation for the peer counselors, and I bet that they will uh, find somebody who really knows that system in India and would be able to, to help you figure out how you get into rehabilitation there, how you get equipment, and what kinds of things. And that probably would be a fabulous resource for you. So you would be able to work right within your own system as opposed to, well, you know, in this uh, country they do that or in another country they do something else. But that would be the best place to go for that. And and I think that you'll uh, meet with much success. So I'm sure that when you're asking if this if your relative will be able to walk, I'm sure you're thinking about walking like he walked before, and you know that we don't know the answer. But will he be mobile? In other words, will he be able to use um, some kind of equipment to get around, or might he even be able to use braces at some point? You know, we don't know what the future holds for him. But, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities. But the important thing is to uh, get some kind of mobility for him so that he can take part in life again. And those peer counselors uh, would really be able to do that. Um, 
Oh, and, and you know, here they have right there, they have the information on how to call, um, how to contact the center and find these specialists. So Bill is the name of the gentleman who heads that up, and he's just fabulous. I connect people with him, and, and everybody has been very pleased. Um, Bernadette also writes in about the YMCA having uh, accessible gyms at low cost often with scholarships available, and that's really important. Um, there are all kinds of uh, places in the community where you will find resources. Many larger communities have pools that are heated or at least heated for therapeutic pool sessions, which is an important thing. Um, she mentions the community colleges. Um, here in St. Louis, we have one community college um, that has a gym for the students. Within that community college, in that gym, they put in an FES bicycle for students who have paralysis. Now, this community college does not have an extremely large number of people with paralysis. It's not any different than any community college. But they had some rambunctious people there that were interested in it, advancing their education. They wanted to work out in the gym, and they formed together as a, a body of students. They went to administration, and they said, you know, it would really be helpful to us if we had this FES bicycle in our gym, and by golly, they bought it for them. So you never know, you know, when you get the power of people together, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I would think that uh, people could do that in the workplace. If you worked at a, at a, in a very large organization, we have some extremely large organizations here in St. Louis that probably have people with some uh, functional issues that could unite and go for their, um, to their administration and ask for specialized equipment of which they share, which you know, is perfectly fine because you know, you're only going to be on a FES bike a certain amount of time during the day. Um, you know, organizations like to do this. Big organizations have foundations. They're happy to provide uh, uh, specialty items for individuals, especially if it's a, in a shared basis. You know, uh, the Lions Club is noted. They're in all many of our communities. They're noted to providing uh, glasses to people who need glasses but can't afford them. Um, so they're another organization. They don't stop at glasses. If they find there's a need in their community, they will organize to have fundraisers to get equipment for people. So there's all kinds of opportunities. Sometimes family members uh, will do things. I had a, a family in California that it was a large extended family. They actually held bake sales and car washes until they got enough money for their family member to get um, advanced therapies, which was an extremely lot of money. So it was a lot of bake sales and car washes. But they were a large enough family and they were able to do it. And it took them a little bit of time, but they did it for their family member. So if, if it's um, people in your family or if you're in school, or they even have websites where you can ask for things and explain your situation. So you just never know how things are going to work out, but don't close any doors. I had one very um, industrious mother that um, it's kind of a sweet story. Um, uh, she was got to be really media savvy, and so periodically we see news stories about her daughter and, and some of the issues that the daughter has. But um, one of the things that she did, and she got it on the TV, was um, the first day of school when her daughter was going to go to kindergarten for the first time. And in their neighborhood, everybody walked to the school, and so she she wanted her daughter, and, and she actually got her daughter... Um, because she was still developing, she was able to use crutches, and so she was going to walk to school with her braces and, and crutches, and the news people were there. But literally thousands of people showed up to walk with her daughter. It was just the sweetest story that there could ever be. So there's all kinds of opportunities. 
Um, I also had a patient one time that was a rather industrious young man in college, and he decided he would start his own business. And when he got his startup fi- funding, he he uh, was a business major, so he knew how to write business plans. And into his business plan for his company, he put in there an FES bicycle, and it was funded. So you just never know. I mean, the creative uh, ideas that people have just blows my mind. I can't imagine. So um, we have somebody who's looking for uh, resources um, for people um, who are needing catheters, pads, and those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, there's uh, there's all kinds of foundations that might help with that sort of thing. Um, there are um, specialty organizations that will uh, help people with. Um, Equipment like Easter Seals will help provide equipment. Um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association has a loaner closet. So if you're finished with a piece of equipment, you can donate to some of these organizations and they will redistribute that equipment to people who, who need uh, more sorts of information. So um, there's just all kinds of opportunities that are available for people out there. Um, yes, it takes a lot of effort on your part, and oh golly, sometimes it seems like it's just never going to happen, but eventually it does happen. Um, so, oh, here Bernadette has our prices for the TheraBand. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, 5 to $10 uh, sometimes. Um, that might be a lot for some people, but for other people, you know, compared to uh, big pieces of exercise equipment, it's not that expensive. Uh, TheraBand, which is these exercise uh, stretching material, um, comes in different prices. Um, you can use TheraBand if you want to go to the fabric store and buy a wide piece of elastic that you can use to stretch that adds some resistance. Um, it might be a little bit less expensive, but uh, TheraBand comes in different strengths. So you might want to start out with the least resistant and then build up to a stronger resistance. You, you know, the, the TheraBand comes in different colors for the different restraint strengths. It does wear out. After you've stretched it a, a good bit, it will wear out. You will need to buy some replacement, and that might be the time to move up to a stronger resistance. So that's always, um, that's always a, uh, an opportunity for you. Um, you know those... Um, exercise balls that people sit on to strengthen their core. If you have uh, someone who can help you with your balance, that's a good balance exercise. If you take the exercise ball, and you know they're so huge, if you take that exercise ball and just use your arms to stretch out with it, stretch over your head, try to put the ball behind your head and move it around, or put your leg up and try to balance just your leg while you're sitting in your chair. You can be kind of innovative. If you go to a store and go through their sporting good exercise equipment, you're going to find all kinds of equipment that would be helpful uh, for you. Um, they have those hand grippers um, that you can use just to strengthen the grip of your hand. That's very in, important and helpful. And the reason why that is so helpful is not only does it give you range of motion, but you've got all these little joints in your hands, and all those little joints have little nerves. So it's very hard to get good range on every single one of your fingers. But if you get one of those grippers and use those grippers or even a light uh, couple of pound uh, weight, you can exercise your upper arm. So don't think you have to start out as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're going to start out uh, real low and help get there. And we will get there. So just you know, be creative um, when you think about it. I have somebody who's using one of those uh, I, I just uh, it's a thigh exerciser. I people will know it as a thigh master, but there are all kinds of brands. So you can use those for your arms. Uh, you can use those um, and help stretch your back a little bit. There are all kinds of things that you know if you if you think about it, maybe I can use it over here or over there or exercise this or that. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, in the hospital, there's some range of motion machines that are used um, for people who have knee replacement, and it just passively moves the leg. 
Um, those can be used uh, for people with spinal cord injury if you check to make sure you don't have a blood clot first and then just passively move your legs. Yeah. You can get one of those. It would be a lot less expensive just to have somebody help move your legs or move your legs yourself. So we're not talking about doing you know, these Olympic kind of uh, exercises, but just getting uh, getting uh, movement. Um, we have a, a person here, um, one of the peer mentors, who uh, started to wheel three miles a day for a workout. That is definitely a good workout, and that's a great. It's inexpensive. Uh, you know, you're moving about a lot of times um, in moving about in a chair. Um, we become fatigued or it becomes hard. Sometimes people have a tendency to want to go really fast so they overstretch their shoulders. So don't push back too far in your wheelchair, but just so put your arm down straight and then just propel your chair further unless you're ranging your arm because we want to protect those shoulders. But this is a great idea. Um, people who have cardiac problems, uh, in addition to uh, being in a chair, sometimes have a difficult getting their exercise, and what you know the exercise for them might be just uh, transferring themselves in and out of the bed, and then just doing it again, transfer back in the bed and transfer out. It, it just gives you that little bit of added exercise. If you're wheeling about, sometimes you know, like um, people who walk for exercise will park further away. If you can, um, if you can tolerate it, and you can park further away, that's a good idea to kind of get in that little bit of extra, extra exercise. If you can do your exercise outside, it can help clear your mind, kind of relieve the stress, being with, uh, with nature. Um, think about places you can go. I'm involved with a lot of people who do walking, but walking slash wheeling. It, you know, you're still getting that, you, and as you do it, you're getting that deep breathing, which is getting that air moving way down into your lungs. So that's an important thing to do. Um, some people walk the mall. We're all familiar with the mall walkers, but you don't have to just always walk the mall. We have these big box stores. If you want to just go and walk up and down through every aisle and around those stores, you can get your walking in pretty quickly. And you can see what's new out on the marketplace. You don't have to buy anything, but any of these stores are good places to go, um, the larger stores where you can really move about. Um, so we have a patient um, who's, uh, oh, here we have a comment about a patient who at age, at age six, uh, became C1. This is our patient from Australia, and he's doing the pool. I find so many people really love the pool as a therapeutic exercise. Now, if you can't go in the pool by yourself and you can't find a therapeutic program, you might be able to find someone who can go to the pool with you. If you can find a heated pool, you're going to do much better. Even if you could find um, a not too hot hot tub um, is a kind of thing. For people with spinal cord injury, sometimes the shock of the cold water can send people into autonomic dysreflexia. So you have to be very careful about that. But water therapy is so wonderful because we're all familiar with moving swiftly through the water and swimming, and we have that resistance. And so that resistance um, helps us exercise and gives us a lot of um, really uh, heavy activity. However, if you're in the pool and you're just floating and you're not resisting the water, that buoyancy can really help um, suspend your body in the water. And so a lot of people will find movement that they don't have under their own control on land because of the gravity issue. When they get into the pool, they find the buoyancy of the water will help hold their extremity up so maybe they can move their arm in the pool where they can't move it out of the pool. That gives them that little bit of um, encouragement. And so then when they, when, they go, when they get strong enough in the pool using the buoyancy, they eventually maybe can translate that movement outside of the pool. So pools are really great, but it, it is kind of more difficult to find a place. But major cities will have um, 
some kind of therapeutic pool time. Um, like Bernadette mentioned, the Ys generally have a therapeutic pool time where they'll up the temperature to make it a little bo bit more comfortable. Um, here we have a person that uh, says that they ha have been an incomplete. And of course, if you have an incomplete injury, you're going to have some kind of either sensation oh, okay. or movement, which is going to be very important. So exercising that uh, weaker leg is going to be important, hopefully be able to get that uh, stronger. So that might be a good opportunity. Um, so how does one keep good muscle tone if unable to continue therapy? Well, then um, you know you can continue. You never have to stop therapy, but you might have to transition your therapy to doing it yourself or having a, a caretaker or caregiver uh, provide the therapy for you. So you never really have to stop therapy. You can keep doing it. And you can um, look on the uh, computer. You can see many exercises that you can do. If you don't know about passive range of motion, you can look up passive range of motion and you'll see um, particular exercises um, that you can, you can do and moving your body about. Um, so uh, you, know, you never have to stop therapy. So that's, that's a good thing to go. Just keep going with it. Um, so, um, so some knee strengthening exercises. Um, so this is from our friend who ha has the incomplete injury, and so by the end of the day, she, she, you know, she's pretty pretty tired and wants to do some strengthening exercises. So I think that um, trying to do anything with the resistance bands that we were talking about, <laughs> think adding the resistance. Now, you know, um, I'm I'm gonna just say this, but it. it just because it's, it hit a thought in my mind. Um, uh, this person says, by the end of the day, walking around and climbing stairs, they're very tired. Yes, that is true. So think about when you're exercising or when you're moving about during the day. You do need some rest periods. Your muscles do need to rest. And so they need to rest and kind of regroup themselves. So if you're a person who's able to move about during the day, think about when you can give some rest time so that your muscles aren't so exhausted by the end of the day that you're not really able to do much else. So if you become tired by the end of the day, build some rest times in. And I, I think you're going to find you're going to do much better at the end of the day by taking some rest times for 10 or 15 minutes during the day. So really being able to you know, just have a really good uh, rest without any stimulation, let your legs relax, maybe if you can elevate them for a little while and you're going to be able to find that you're going to do much, much better. So um, sometimes we think we really have to keep moving, 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 but um, and moving is always good. I'm not going to say that it's not. But sometimes we have to build in some strength too. So adding some resistance exercises and just building up the individual muscles. Our muscles are uh, built in a balanced system. There are muscles that will push our leg forward, and then there's a separate set of muscles that pull the leg back. So if you want to strengthen your legs, you need to have some build up the muscles that pull them forward but also the muscle that pulls it back. So whenever you do an exercise, you want to do those that flex and those that muscles that extend. So sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to uh, uh, put a, a can of soup in my hand and I'm going to uh, pull my hand up to my shoulder and that's going to add a little bit of resistance. Uh, maybe my water bottle and I'm going to do this 10 times. Okay, then then if that's what you can tolerate, do that and then rest. So don't think you have to start out doing a thousand times or you know, if you can do ten times, that's fine. And then build it up over time. You can even make yourself a little chart. And if you find you're getting too exhausted, then hold at that particular rate that you're doing for a while. Um, so um, Here's a person that writes in that they're in Bristol, Connecticut, and they have a channel. Um, let's see, they have a, a recreation fitness community center in Bristol, uh, Connecticut that will uh, help you with adaptive exercise. If you are fortunate enough that you can go to a gym 
and they have trainers there. Many of the trainers will also have information about doing adaptive exercise. If you cannot afford that, don't think, well, then I don't get to have exercise. You'll have to be a little more inventive and in seeing there are organizations that you can look on websites and find out some adaptive exercise. You can Google that information and then assess and see if that's right for you. So if they have you doing something with your hip joint and you know you have a problem with your hip joint, you might not want to do that particular exercise. So you know, think about what's right for you and then be able to um, participate in that. So um, um, there's many opportunities for exercise, and I hope that you'll get involved with those. Um, we need our exercise to maintain our general health, which is important. But also with spinal cord injury, we need some exercise to decrease complications. So if we can keep our bodies healthy, that helps reduce the complications that I uh, discussed early on in the session. But it's also important to keep our bodies healthy because right now there's just an explosion of research um, that's being conducted um, for individuals um, to help have improved function or return of function for individuals with spinal cord injury. Much of the research is being sponsored by the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. But there is just a lot of research going on for people who, who have been injured recently, but also people that have been injured in the past more distantly. So there's a good opportunity um, to take advantage in some of these experimental trials. Um, you can look on uh, NIH.gov and see if there's any uh, trials going on in your area that maybe you might be interested in participating. You want to think about doing that. You know, just because it's offered, you want to evaluate that trial carefully to make sure it's something that you really want to do and that it's appropriate for you. But um, there's all kinds of opportunities um, for exercise programs. It's each community is going to be completely different. Um, if you have a, a university or a college, a community college that has a medical program or any of the healthcare professional programs, a PT program, sometimes they're interested in people coming in to be evaluated or for the students to work with individuals who have some kind of unique need that the students can maybe see, and that's a good opportunity to get a free evaluation. They are monitored by uh, uh, registered professionals, so be it nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Call up your uh, local university or community college. See if they have a program, a pre-med program, where you can maybe be evaluated by a student. But there will be somebody who will be evaluating them. So um, um, check, you know, check into all kinds of different resources. Um, talk to your healthcare professional and see if they know of anything in your community. Um, uh, check with the community peers at the Reed Foundation. If you haven't connected with one of the community peers, this is a good opportunity. Maybe you can get a group together in your community um, that might be willing to uh, invest in some of these advanced therapy options. I mean, you know, you just never know how things will work out. But you know, people who get motivated tend to really um, um, find ways. And so maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, but there's there's no harm in trying to get trying. things organized. Um, is there any other questions? We only have a few minutes left. So let me just see if there's any other questions. Um, it seems like we our group is in agreement. Exercise is important, and we need to keep moving with our bodies. Just keep them moving. Um, <coughs> any Any other questions or thoughts? then I think I'll turn it back to Julie. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our monthly Ask Nurse Linda online discussions. You can also go to ChristopherReed.org slash nurse and participate in our online community. And Nurse Linda is on there answering your questions all the time. <laughs> she is very good at that, so please um, feel free to 
um, leave your questions there. And uh, the more questions you get about a certain topic, that's what we um, try to focus on for our next web chat. Well, this is being recorded, so if you would like to view this later, you can go to ChristopherReeves.org slash web chats, and that will be up, um, the recording for this will be up at the end of the week. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and look forward to talking with you all next month. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, bye.